Hello everyone. Welcome to the seventh lecture of the course Statistical Thermodynamics. The topic of this lecture is a review of classical thermodynamics, specifically adiabatic processes. Before beginning our discussion on adiabatic processes, let us examine an important property of gases, namely specific heat. This is necessary as background for discussing adiabatic processes. As we have seen in an earlier lecture, the specific heat of any substance is the heat required to raise the temperature of a fixed quantity of the substance, say one mole of it by one Kelvin. The specific heat depends on how the state of the system is changed. Heat absorbed can increase the temperature of a substance, but it can also do work and not increase the temperature or it can do both. Specific heat is therefore a path function. Let us explore this some more. In general, specific heat C is equal to Q by delta T for one mole of substance. Let us restrict our discussion to ideal gases and only pressure volume work. From the first law of thermodynamics, heat absorbed Q is equal to delta U minus W. Since work is equal to minus P external times delta V, the heat absorbed Q is equal to delta U plus P external times delta V. We can see in this equation that the heat absorbed by the gas can be used to increase its internal energy and to do work. Let us now consider two special cases in which a gas absorbs heat. The first case is when expansion of the gas is not allowed. So the volume in this case is a constant delta V is equal to zero. In this case, specific heat of the gas at constant volume denoted as Cv is equal to Q divided by delta T at constant volume. We can see from this equation that if the gas is not allowed to expand, then the heat absorbed simply causes a change in its internal energy. So, Cv is equal to delta E by delta T, which can be written for infinitesimal changes as du by dt. Recall that for one mole of a monoatomic ideal gas, we have derived the internal energy to be U is equal to 3 by 2 RT. So, du by dt is equal to 3 by 2 r and Cv is equal to 3 by 2 r. The second case we will consider of the gas absorbing heat is when the gas is allowed to expand but its pressure is kept constant.
the heat absorbed will now be more than case 1 because some of the heat is used for doing work. The specific heat of the gas at constant pressure denoted as Cp is equal to Q by delta T at constant pressure is equal to du plus PdV by Tt at constant pressure. That is du by dt at constant pressure plus pdv by dt at constant pressure. We have just seen that this term for a monoatomic ideal gas is equal to 3 by 2 r. And to get an expression for this term, we use the ideal gas law and write V is equal to RT by P for one mole of gas, which implies that dV by dT is equal to R by P. So substituting R by P here instead of dV by dT, we get this entire term to be simply R and Cp becomes 3 by 2 R plus R. So Cp is equal to 5 by 2 R for a monoatomic ideal gas. We can see that the difference between Cp and Cv is equal to R. This expression happens to be true for all ideal gases, not just a monoatomic ideal gas, although the actual expressions for the Cp and Cv are different for non-monoatomic gases. There are a few points which you should note. The first is that the difference between Cp and Cv for ideal gases is significant. It is two-thirds the value of Cv. For solids and liquids on the other hand, this difference between Cp and Cv is quite small. The second point is that when heat is absorbed by a gas, it is not necessary that every time its volume or its pressure is a constant in the process. The conditions described above are like two orthogonal conditions and every other process is a combination of them. The third point to note is that the change in internal energy of a gas is directly related to Cv. So delta U is equal to Cv delta T. This expression is always valid, even for cases when the gas expands and there is a change in volume. This expression is very useful for solving problems. If you know the change in temperature of an ideal gas during any process, you can easily calculate its change in internal energy. Let us now discuss adiabatic processes. An adiabatic process is one in which the heat absorbed during the process is zero. The question we ask is, if the initial state of the ideal monoatomic gas is P1 V1 and after adiabatic expansion, the final volume of the gas is V2, what is the final pressure or what is the final temperature? Instead of volume, if we knew pressure or temperature, how to obtain the other variables 
P, V or T. Let us first answer this question for an adiabatic reversible process and then an adiabatic irreversible process. So consider an adiabatic reversible process. The initial state of the gas is T1, V1, T1 and it undergoes adiabatic reversible expansion and let's say its final pressure is P2. We want to find out what the final volume V2 is and what the final temperature T2 is. By definition, Q is equal to zero. So from the first law of thermodynamics, delta U is equal to W. As the gas does work, it cools and its internal energy decreases. To calculate the work done, consider a quasi-static process that is do the expansion in very small steps. Then the change in internal energy for a small step du is equal to ncv dt. The work done in the small step is equal to minus P V V which is equal to minus N R T by V D V using the ideal gas law. Now if we equate these two we get N C V D T is equal to minus N R T by V D V the N can be cancelled and collecting terms with T on one side, we get CV by R DT by T is equal to minus DV by V. If we integrate both sides of this expression for the full range of the process, we get CV by R integral T1 to T2 dt by T is equal to minus of integral V1 to V2 dV by V. We were able to take the CV out of the integral because for a monoatomic ideal gas, the CV does not depend on temperature. Evaluating the integrals and substituting the limits, we get CV by R ln T2 by T1 is equal to minus ln of V2 by V1. So ln of T2 by T1 to the power of CV by R is equal to ln of V1 by V2. Taking antilog, we get T2 by T1 to the power of CV by R is equal to V1 by V2. We have obtained here a relation between volume and temperature. So if we knew the final volume V2, we could calculate the final temperature T2. Or if we knew the final temperature T2, we could calculate the final volume V2. Let us now get a relation between pressure and volume. We will start with the relation between temperature and volume. T2 by T1. This is what we just derived. Cv by R is equal to V1 by V2. And using the ideal gas law, we will substitute 
instead of T2, P2, V2 and instead of T1, we will substitute P1, V1. This to the power of Cv by R is equal to V1 by V2. Raising both sides to the power of R by Cv, we get P2 V2 by P1 V1 is equal to V1 by V2 to the power of R by Cv. Taking the volume terms to the right hand side, we get P2 by P1 is equal to V1 by V2 to the power of 1 plus R by Cv. So, P2 by P1 is equal to V1 by V2 to the power of Cv plus R by Cv. And we have seen that for an ideal gas, Cv plus R is equal to Cp. So, this is equal to V1 plus V2 to the power of Cp by Cv. And we can write this succinctly as P1 V1 to the power of gamma is equal to P2 V2 to the power of gamma, where we define gamma to be the ratio of the two specific heats Cp and Cv. So, in effect, we have obtained here a relation between pressure and volume of a monoatomic ideal gas when it expands adiabatically and reversibly. If we know the final pressure P2, we will be able to calculate the final volume V2 using this expression. We will now obtain similar relations between the pressure, volume and temperature for an ideal monoatomic gas for an adiabatic irreversible process. We can think of an adiabatic irreversible process in the following way. The monoatomic ideal gas is in a cylinder like this with a piston head and some masses on the piston head and the cylinder walls are made up of insulating material so that no heat flows into the gas. We remove some weights and now the gas has expanded to look like this. Let's say the initial pressure was P1, initial volume was V1 and initial temperature was T1 and let us say that we know that the final pressure because of this weight is P2. The question is what is V2 and what is T2? Since the process is adiabatic, Q is equal to 0. And using the first law of thermodynamics, delta U is equal to W. The change in internal energy during this process for one mole of an ideal gas is Cv T2 minus T1. And the work done in this irreversible process is minus P2, the external pressure, V2 minus V1. Let us now try to solve for T2 because that is the only unknown in this equation. So, T2 minus T1 is equal to minus P2 V2 minus V1 by Cv. T2 is equal to T1 minus 
P2 by Cv, V2 minus V1. We want to eliminate this P2. So let us try to write this P2 V2 in terms of R T2. And what we do is that is equal to T1 minus 1 by Cv P2 V2 minus P2 and let me write this as P1 V1 by P1. So now I can write P2 V2 in terms of RT2 and P1 V1 as RT1 and that way I can eliminate the variable V1 and V2 from this expression and instead just have P1 and P2. That is T1 minus 1 over Cv Rt2 from the ideal gas law minus P2 by P1 Rt1. Let me just note here that we have used Pv is equal to R. T. Now if we just simplify this further, we get that is equal to T1 minus R T2 by Cv plus R P2 T1 by P1 Cv. Collecting the terms T2 on the left hand side, we get T2 1 plus R by Cv is equal to T1 1 plus R P2 by Cv P1. Let me write this expression on the next page so that we can continue there. In this expression, let us substitute the value of Cv for a monoatomic ideal gas, which is 3 by 2 R. So we get T2 1 plus 2 by 3 is equal to T1 1 plus 2 by 3 P2 by P1. So 5 by 3 times T2 is equal to T1 1 plus 2P2 by 3P1 and T2 is equal to T1 3 by 5 plus 2 by 5 P2 by P1. We now have an expression where we have the final temperature in terms of the final pressure. We can get a similar expression for the final volume in terms of the final pressure. I leave it to you as an exercise to derive the relation of the final volume V2 in terms of the final pressure. The next thing we will do is write expressions for the work done for an adiabatic reversible process and an adiabatic irreversible process. First, a adiabatic reversible process. The work done in an adiabatic process is equal to the change in internal energy. 
So W is CV T2 minus T1 and we can write that as CV by R R T2 minus R T1 because we want to write this in terms of pressure and volume and using the ideal gas law for one mole of ideal gas this is P2 V2 minus P1 V1. This is the expression for W reversible and this is sometimes simplified further by writing this R as Cp minus Cv and then taking the Cv in the denominator you can write this as 1 over gamma minus 1 where gamma is the ratio of specific heats and here is the standard expression for W reversal. We can see here that if we started with the initial state of the gas P1 V1 and it expanded and the final pressure or the final volume was known, then we can find the unknown parameter using P1 V1 to the power of gamma is equal to P2 V2 to the power of gamma. And then using this expression, we can calculate the work done in the reversible adiabatic process. The next thing is to derive an expression for the work done in an adiabatic irreversible process. We start like in the adiabatic reversible process. The work done is the change in internal energy because no heat is absorbed. We have just derived an expression for this final temperature in terms of the initial temperature and that expression we have derived is T2 is equal to T1 3 by 5 plus 2 by 5 P2 by P1. So we substitute this into the expression and W is Cv times T1 3 by 5 plus 2 by 5 P2 by P1 minus 1. This is equal to Cv T1 and this becomes 2 by 5 P2 by P1 minus 2 by 5. Now writing T1 as P1 V1 by R using the ideal gas law for one mole of gas W becomes Cv P1 V1 by R 2 by 5 times P2 by P1 minus 2 over 5. We can take 2 by 5 Cv common in the two terms and then we have P2 V1 by R minus P1 V1 by R which is 2 by 5 Cv V1 by R and P2 minus P1 in the brackets. Now if we write this phi R by 2 in the denominator as Cp, we get Cv by Cp times V1 P2 minus P1 
and writing this ratio of specific heats as gamma, we get W irreversible is equal to V1 by gamma P2 minus P1. We now have expressions for the work done in both an adiabatic reversible process and an adiabatic irreversible process. Let me end this lecture by leaving you with some food for thought. The questions here are quite challenging and I hope you will engage with them sincerely and be able to resolve them. My first problem for you is to show that the work done by an ideal monoatomic gas in an adiabatic reversible process is more than that in an adiabatic irreversible process. So you have expressions for the work done in both these processes and you have to show that the adiabatic reversible work is greater than the adiabatic irreversible work. This is quite trivial to show in the case of an isothermal process and we have done that before but it is not so easy for an adiabatic process and let us see whether you can show it. The second question is that if we do an irreversible expansion of a monoatomic ideal gas and follow that up by compressing it so that the pressure is back to the original pressure, then is the temperature of the gas after it has returned to the original pressure greater than, less than or equal to its original temperature? Let us see if you can solve these problems. If you can, you are really up to speed with whatever we have done so far. In the next lecture, we will talk about the Carnot cycle. See you for that.